Hi, I'm Douglas Vogt from the Diehl Foundation. Uh, this is uh, video series four, part four B. And we're gonna cover, uh, did a meteor or asteroid cause the extinctions at the KT boundary? KT is, is uh, the Cretaceous, after Cretaceous and everything newer, that's the boundary. The reason why it's a K rather than a C is that the uh, Germans are the ones who originally named it and uh, they spell Cretaceous with a K. Uh, continued deception in science by government. And that has actually tied in with this. You're gonna find out why everybody or, or every scientist is now locked into the idea that if you have a mass extinction, you have to have something hitting the earth. Otherwise, you know, like an asteroid or a meteor. Otherwise, nothing happens. Um, sea level changes and loss of ocean water. Comparison of the moon tactites to earth tactites. Uh, this was gonna be a little longer uh, video. This one's gonna be about 45 minutes. The, and I decided to pull some of the stuff out regarding, I'm gonna have in the next video, the, um, the meteor that was found in Greenland and um, the uh, stuff they found, tactics they found in Antarctica and other places of the world. So you can see the comparison that the tactics they found on the Earth are the same um, micrometeorites or glass beads that they found on the moon. There's really no difference. Uh, the, we're going to cover some of the stuff that's in Chapter 8 in, in this in my last book, God's Day of Judgment book. But um, it's gonna be a lot of new stuff in this, and I'm, uh, I'm gonna be forced to actually write a book just on the causes of the Ice Age and polyversals and expand it so it's more updated. This is 10 or 11 years old already. It was done in 2007. Uh, <clears throat> you remember the movie 2000 and... Uh, uh, great, I'm sorry, Impact or um, uh, what was the other one? Armageddon, where a comet, well not a comet, but a meteor or an asteroid winds up hitting the Earth and it destroys and it just keeps expanding and expanding and expanding. And here it goes bigger and bigger and eventually consumes the whole world. Like this one meteor or asteroid hits the planet on one side of the Earth and this fire is supposed to go all around the world. If anyone believes that, I got some swamp land in Florida you can buy, okay? So this is great for a movie because you really have to leave your, your consciousness at the front door when you go to a movie. But this can't be in real life. When they tested the first atomic bomb, some brilliant scientist, PhD, thought that, gee, if we detonate this atomic bomb, it's gonna ignite the oxygen, and the whole planet's gonna burn up. Obviously, that didn't happen. It only was localized in that one area, and that was it. One of the reasons this can't happen uh, is that the inverse square law, that energy is decreased by the distance, square of the distance. Uh, if you have any doubts, I have a large firecracker, and set up a bunch of you know, playing cards so many distances away from it, detonate the explosive and you'll see which cards fall over. Um, that's the way it works. I mean, this is probably localized to maybe a few hundred miles, any blast. As it is, you're gonna see this thing landed in water, so you're not gonna have this big fireball going off. The ocean takes care of that. This is what the Gulf of Mexico looked like shoreline-wise, 65 million years ago. Obviously, 65 million is merely an educated guess. Nobody really knows because nobody was around then. This is where they think this meteor hit, right there, which means 65 million years ago, it hit water, probably, oh, four or 500 feet of water, maybe 600 feet of water. So, um, you're not gonna have a big fireball, the water would have taken care of that. In fact, I'm not even too sure how much, you can have a big splash, a big tidal wave, but how much of the comet's really gonna go in the atmosphere? And other scientists said the same thing, if a meteor or an asteroid hit the Earth, it's gonna be mixed up with a lot of the dirt that it hit. So anyway, 
Here's the location right here in current day, which is off the coast, which is about two, three hundred feet deep. So add another three hundred and you realize it's going to hit a lot of that thing would have hit a lot of water. This is an outline of how they found it. These are basically big glory holes, uh, sinkholes around the whole area. And that's how they kind of put it together. And there may have been something there, but it's so incredibly old, you know. They estimate 66 million years ago. So you take it from there. These are, I have, this is a, um, a, a rocky, I wouldn't say a meteor, more like an asteroid. This was once, I think, well, this is what it looks like a cross section. You see there's rocks in there. So this thing probably came from a planet of some sort, probably from the asteroid belt between Mars and Jupiter, there probably was a planet there and, and something blew it up. Um, this here is my nickel iron um, meteor. And both of these things do not outgas and they cannot blow up in the atmosphere as it enters. Only a comet could because as I showed you in the previous uh, video, it's um, a big dirty snowball. Um, over half of it is water, and about 20 or 30 percent is organic material. And so like 66 plus percent is water, what came from the ocean. So what happens when you got a comet entering the atmosphere and it starts heating up around the outside, all the heat transfers to the middle, eventually the water in the middle expands and eventually like a boiler blows up, it blows up. So I don't think they do much damage if it ever was big enough to actually hit the ground, but it makes a big explosion. And I think that's what happened in, in um, uh, eastern Siberia, the Tengusta. Uh, I think it was a comet that entered the atmosphere and then heated up and then blew up like steam. This is where, this is Luis Alvarez. And this is the article that changed everything regarding you thinking of what caused the mass extinctions. Extraterrestrial cause for the Cretaceous Territory extinctions. Louis W. Alvarez. His son is Walter Alvarez. He's in the geology department. This is a nuclear physicist, particle physicist. And why he got involved with this is you're going to find out later. Uh, the articles in Science, June 1980, volume 208, pages 1095. Uh, many of this, the references I'm going to show you here, I have the PDFs of these articles. If you want to see a copy of it, send me an email to info at dieholdfoundation.com and tell me which one you want to see and I'll forward you the PDF and you can go enjoy them just like I have. Some of it's technical reading. You may have to, couple, have to read it a couple of times. And their language isn't the best. They get as scientific as they possibly can, I think, to obscure the meaning. You'll see what I mean. This is the awards this guy's gotten. This is only some of the awards. I'm showing you this for a reason. I want you to really pay attention. There's a zinger at the end of this, and you'll see how this is related to my book, Reality Revealed. Um, oh, I'll tell you now, the book was out, this book was out in, by December of 1977. And I had a list I gave the publisher, who was Vic Ardling, uh, of scientists I wanted to give copies to. Uh, he delivered two copies to William Tiller at Stanford University, who later bought two more copies. And he mailed a copy to this guy. So he had it by December or January of 19, uh, 1977 or January of 1978. He had a copy of the book. This thing got published June 1980. I'll tell, you'll see the zinger at the, when I get to the end of his section. You'll understand. <clears throat> Medal of Merit, 1947. Because he was involved evidently with the Manhattan Project building the first atomic bomb. Fellow of the... Fellow of the American Philosophical Society, 1953. Uh, Fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Science, 1958. 
California Scientist of the Year in 1960, Albert Einstein Award 1961, National Merit of Science 1963, Michelson Award 65, Nobel Prize in Physics 1968, University of Chicago Alumni Medal 1978, National Inventors Hall of Fame 78, Enrico Fermi Award of the U.S. Department of Energy, 87, the guys who build the bombs. I told you he's a particle physicist. Ask yourself, why is he doing this? You're going to find out. Now, <clears throat> these are the quotes I've gotten right from that journal article. Um, if you see anything that's in brackets, it means I added, that's, I added for clarity for you. Okay, in the summary, <clears throat> Reasons are given to indicate that this iridium is extraterrestrial in origin. L um, let me explain that now. <clears throat> this paper is a result of some expeditions he did to Italy and Denmark. And he must have spent at least a year, year and a half doing the research for that paper. So work your way backwards. Figure three months to get it approved, the journal Science, people peer review and then they have to publish it. So at least three months there, maybe even four months. So he's doing this article and doing this research after he got a copy of the book. I'll go on. From a nearby supernova, suggested causes include dot, 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 due to a random or a cyclical coincidence of causative factors, <laughs> like a clock cycle, <clears throat> A magnetic reversal, bet on that one, nearby supernova. Uh, not assuming our sun, but you'll see where he, he ties that in. You'll see the section. Identification of extraterrestrial platinum metals in deep sea sediments. The platinum groups like five or six uh, rare metals, and they a very low content on the crust of the earth. They think it's much higher deeper down. Anyway, that's the premise. This study begins with the realization that the platinum group elements, uh, platinum, iridium, osmium, and rhodium, are much less abundant in the Earth's crust and upper mantle than they are in meteors and average solar system material. But he never really says what average solar system material is. What it really is is that dust and stuff like that that they found on the moon. Terrestrial iridium measures at 0.26 parts per billion. Very rare. And so I've actually seen numbers of 0 0.026. So you take it from there where, it, where it's really at. Increased iridium levels had been found in deep sea sediments. Considerations of this type promoted us to measure the iridium concentrations in the one centimeter thick clay later that marks the KT or CT Cretaceous Turati boundary. The geomagnetic reversal strat stratigraph of the upper Cretaceous and Pliocene was established, correlated to the marine magnetic anomaly sequence. It was, they had a bunch of uh, big kill offs of marine animals, and they were able to carbon 14 data, or I shouldn't say carbon 14, um, to a magnetic reversal. Um, and the extinction of most of the na nanoplankton was shown to be synchronous with the disappearance of the gene genus. I can't pronounce it. I'll let you try. In other words, you have a magnetic reversal and you have a mass extinction. That's the important part. And that's how you actually mark these things. 27 of the 28 elements shown very similar patterns of abundance variations, but iridium shows a grossly different behavior. It increases by a factor of about 30 in coincidence with the CT boundary, whereas none of the other elements as much as doubles, that's still pretty significant, the doubles, with respect to an average behavior. It never really defines what an average behavior is. You're supposed to know it. This is where, this is where he did in, in Italy. Here's Cretaceous material. Here's the boundary of clay and the glass beads, or microtactites. And here's the later material. I mean, uh, 
you know, towards us. There's, there's the boundary. As shown in table one, the iridium, the iridium in the boundary layer, and this is what he discovered, 4.16 plus or minus 1.88 parts per billion, so that's much higher than the Earth, rise, uh, rises by about a factor of 160 over the background level. So, um, extraterrestrial sources with uh, iridium levels of hundreds of parts per billion or higher are more likely to have produced the IR anomaly. So he knows it came from outer space. He's just trying to hang his hat on a meteor or, or asteroid hitting the Earth. Danish samples, layers produced. There are, however, localized terrestrial sources with much higher iridium abundance. For example, nickel sulfide and uh, chromate ores have iridium levels of hundreds and thousands of parts per billion. I have noticed that nickel seems to be associated with the iridium and some of the other rare metals. There's a prima facie evidence for an abnormal influx in the observations that the excess iridium occurs exactly at the time of one of the extinctions that the extinctions were extraordinary events which may well indicate an extraordinary cause. Uh, that the e extinctions were clearly worldwide and that the iridium anomaly is known, is now known for two different areas in Western Europe and in New Zealand. You could tell right off the bat, if a meteor or comet hit one part of the Earth, he estimates that this meteor was 6.6 .6 kilometers, which is about four miles in diameter. You think something that four miles in diameter hits the ocean, the water, is going to spread all over the place, all over the whole world? No, and logically it doesn't make any sense, but they're trying to hang their hat on that to keep your mind off of the sun. Never forget that. It's, try, it's like, a, it's like um, a shell game where's the pea, and have them looking at the wrong location, that's what they're doing. Uh, native results of tests for the supernova hypothesis. This is where he tries, he makes a deliberate mistake here. Deliberate. You'll understand why in a second. This is my note. The closest star to Earth is, a, is Proximius uh, Centauri, near Alpha Centauri, this one. About 4.22 light years away. Okay, that's, that's the facts. The other one's 4.5 light years away. There's no stars closer than that. Here's his quote. A rough calculation of the distance from the assumed supernova to the solar system, the amount iridium expected to be blown off in the supernova explosion gives about 0 0.1 light years. This isn't a typo. The probability is about 10 to the minus 9, or 10 billion, that during the last 100 million years, a supernova occurred within the distance from the sun. Any mechanism with such a low priori probability is obviously a one-time only theory. So he's trying to get your mind over, it can't be the sun, can't be a supernova, but when he says 0.1 light years, that's our solar system. I mean, it doesn't go as far as that, but he's saying, why didn't he say 10 or 20 or 30 light years or 100 light years or 1,000 light years? Because obviously, a, if a nova happened or what they call a supernova, this dust shell would barely ever hit us. And he'd think he knows it. But saying this is, is an obvious mistake. You have to realize, when someone submits a paper to any journal, certainly journal science, it goes through peer review. So two or three guys, physicists, other also read this thing. They didn't correct it. Now remember, in my first video on part four, Ken Kuzman's letter, that footnote, where his cousin was an astrophysicist, said, other scientists know that the sun does something between 12 and 15,000 years. They didn't know what but they knew something terrible was, which tells me the people who must have looked at this, this paper, they also know 
And he's giving a clue also. This is what the truth is. You look at our own son. <clears throat> Therefore, the uh, anomalous iridium is very likely of solar system origin. He's getting honest here. And did not come from a supernova or other source outside the solar system. Well, yeah, this is the size of this thing that he, he calculated. Um, he's giving clues. He really is. He's giving clues here. Quote, we must note, finally, uh, an aspect of the biological record that does not appear to be in accord with the asteroid impact hypothesis or with any, uh, or with any sudden or violent mechanism. Extinction of the formophilian and the nanoplankton occurs within reverse geomantic polarity. This is the place where he actually took the samples in Italy. That's what that name is all about. It goes on from here. These are the elements that he found on the glass beads and in the clay, or the soil area in that one or two centimeter area. Silicon, aluminum, iron, magnesium, calcium, uh, sodium, potassium, titanium, sulfur, etc. Point being, these are exactly the same elements that I showed in the, in the previous, um, and you'll see, I think I repeated it again here, uh, that we found on the tactites or glass beads from the moon. <clears throat> now I just re I repeated this already. He had a copy of, of the book. I got that call from Fort Lewis, maybe the beginning part of 1978. And when I didn't go down to Fort Lewis, uh, I got this guy who called me up, he said it was a retired CIA agent, two or three weeks after I didn't go down to Fort Lewis. By the way, I told Vic and I told my other friend when this happened. So they concurred what I said, how I remember it is how they remember it also. And it was just myself saying this. But I told both of them when this thing did happen. So the agent said, quote, how did you figure it out? Well, in order for him to say that, somebody had to have read the book. And I now, I now know who read the book, Luis Alvarez, because we delivered it to him. This is, I think, what the sequence of events happened. Alvarez, this is from Wikipedia, believe it or not. You can read this yourself. They'll probably pull this thing off soon. Alvarez was a member of the Jason Defense Advisory Group. Never heard of him before. <clears throat> the Jason Defense Advisory Group's sponsors include the Department of Defense, Department of Energy, these are the guys who make the bombs, and the U.S. intelligence community, the CIA, our little friends at the CIA, most of the resulting JSON reports are classified. We won't see them in journals. Needless to say, what I think happened, this guy was so well connected, and you'll find out why they could trust him in a second, that he approached them this is my theory. He approached them after I read my book, and his son probably read my book too, he was the geologist, and they realized I was right. It's a clock cycle that runs through time and that explains all of it. They had to come up with an alternate explanation for the mass extinctions. And that's why every scientist after this paper in 1980 don't, doesn't bother looking at the sun for doing this stuff, other than Thomas Gold, when he was analyzing the stuff they found from the moon, and he was criticized from guys who had contracts with the government, that don't look at the sun. So they're all looking for a crater someplace that can say, hey, and you'll see a paper in a second about that. Hey, I can explain this extinction with a crater and I'll be famous. Anyway, I think that's the sequence. He or his son wound up going to Jason, defense agency, told them what they read, and they had to come up with an alternate explanation so the science community would believe him and go off on a tangent that would lead you to a dead end. He was also a member of Bohemian Club. 
I'm sure half of you must be laughing your head off right now, and you should. <laughs> this is about as pagan as you can get. This looks like a Syrian or Sumerian costume, and they're going to do a ceremony, and the ceremony will get you as mad as hell, and it should. The cremation of care. The cremation uh, is an elite ceremony. Oh, sorry, ceremony is a, uh, an elite ceremony held at the Bohemian Grove, just north of San Francisco, with the ruling members of government and industry. And you could also add academia to it too. Uh, uh, congregate to watch this ceremony where the edifice of a child is set ablaze or fire and placed into a man-made lake. These people are sicko. I don't care what position they are, these people are sick. I have been told by somebody who knows, somebody who knows more intelligence-wise about this group, sometimes really the edifice of a child is really a real child. That's how sick these folks are. And I'm sure some of you, if you don't believe me, just go on to um, uh, Google Images and search for Bohemian Grove or Bohemian Club. And they have like class, class pictures of a whole bunch. I saw George, um, um, not George Bush, I saw um, Ford, President Ford there too, maybe before he was a president. And a lot of other politicians and industrial leaders and stuff like that, and the ones who were not labeled were probably academics, I'm sure. But analyze the word care. Ask yourself, who do you care for? Care for babies and children? the very old, uh, the infirmed, and what are, they plan what are they doing, the ceremony? Cremation. They want to burn them up. In other words, their feelings for caring any for anybody is up in smoke. In other words, I'll translate for those who haven't figured it out yet, they hate our guts. They look at us like sheep that be sheared every April 15th, and we're going to let them decide how we live, whether how many gallons are in our toilet to flush. Yes, there is actually a regulation for that. And they think they know better how to run our lives. Now you understand how much they hate our guts. Oh, it crosses all political lines. I'm sure there's a lot of socialists and communists in this group. They just hate our guts. They don't, the politics have nothing to do with it. It's an ego trip for them. <clears throat> Iridium an uh, anomaly apparently synchronous with the terminal Eocene, Eocene extinctions. This is his son, Department of Geology. Basically, the article goes through and basically says he found a drill hole in the Caribbean and it was a higher Iridium, but, but it was not as high as some of the other spots. It was only 0.42 plus or minus parts per billion. So he's trying to support his father and say, we found another place where um, uh, we have a reading, a higher reading of iridium. Impact looks real, the catastrophe smaller. Um, in 81, a year later, a whole bunch of scientists were, were disagreeing with Luis Alvarez as to the scope of how big a disaster he was painting in this article. Uh, so this is what they say. Ames Research Center uh, shank, sh uh, shrank the ominous three-year period of darkness down to a mere comfortable three months. I didn't even think it was that. If it hit the water, you're not going to have all that much material in the, in the, in the atmosphere. It's not like uh, Volcano Toba or Krakatoa going off. That threw a lot more, I think, in the atmosphere. The marine extinctions were not only... Uh, sudden but also extensive. 49% of all genera of floating marine organisms disappeared. I want to explain that. Remember what I said about this dust shell when it hits the Earth 17 or 18 hours later? Well, before then, the sun novas and the Earth stops its rotation, which I will explain in the last of this part, Series 4, not in this video, but in two from now, the scientific reason using the theory of multidimensional reality why the Earth stops its rotation and then goes in the other direction. 
I thought originally that the deep sea canyons were proof enough because it's pretty obvious that's the only way you can form them. But no, I'm going to give you the, the scientific reason why behind the whole thing. So this is the reason why. Earth stops the rotation and the sun has novid. And the heat, we can only imagine how much heat, but it's got to be over 1,500 to 2,000 degrees centigrade. And evaporates seven or 800 feet of ocean water. So all that plant life, or animal life, or maybe plant life, that's in the ocean there is going to get boiled away as the, as the uh, water evaporates and goes down. It's going to evaporate and kill off all those fish and one cell then is the plankton. So that's why basically the cells burst and the contents of the cell are in the water. That's why the comets have, they said, 42 or 43% organic material. <laughs> well, that's where the organic material came from. And that's why, that's like half, you're looking at half the size of the Earth. Well, that's, that's why it's that. It's a real big kill off. Some novas are worse than others. Mars meteorites had been thought to mix with a mass of crustal rock many times their own size, thus swamping their exotic chemical uh, composition with ordinary terrestrial rock. There should have been a little of the asteroid left um, in any, any one place for the geo geologists or geochemists to recognize according to this thinking. Uh, elements on the moon. Types of highly, um, highly energized particles resulting in a wide variety of other radioactive elements such as these are the radioactive elements, the isotopes that they found on the moon. And what I noticed on all these geologists, when they did the test for chemical composition, they never tested for isotopes, nor did they ever look for f fission tracks, which is the two things the scientists who looked at the stuff from the moon were ordered to look for, because that would tell you it's not from volcanism, which I mentioned there's enough journal articles from the journals that said it is not from volcanic activity because of fission tracks and uh, aluminum-26, beryllium-10, and a bunch of other radioactive elements. But this is the elements that they found on the moon. All of them are radioactive or isotopes. Sometimes have, some scientists have detected an increase of 50% to 80% of radioactive elements. 11,000 plus years ago on Kodiak Island. And here's references for you. So, this is a recap of the, the elements that they found on the moon. Of the, these are the picture of the tactites. Unfortunately, they're not color. Uh, they didn't give us color in the journal of science uh, of what the stuff looked like from the moon besides the round beads. Uh, silicon, aluminum, iron, calcium, magnesium, sodium, Potassium, titanium, phosphorus, magnesium, uh, manganese, rather, chromium, and sulfur. And here, this is from Apollo 11 and Apollo 17. This is Apollo 12, and you'll see 14 and 15 also. It's all the same group of chemicals, or elements, all the same thing. And here's references for you. Now, the uh, reason I'm showing this is um, Nova V838 Monocretus. And we're probably looking at the, the poles, you know, down through the pole, the axis of the thing. And this is probably his planetary um, uh, ring. Uh, you can't assume that this dust shell is always homogeneous, uh, both for the quantity and types of elements in the dust shell that hits you. Uh, and whether, you'll notice as, as the shell expands, it develops holes in it. Because, I mean, after all, we don't know how thick this matter shell is from the sun. It may only be 50, 100,000 miles, maybe uh, 300,000 miles. I don't know. I don't think anybody else knows either. But when it blows off and it's just expanding, it's going to develop holes. Like if there was a sunspot, that would be a hole, and all of a sudden it would grow. If we get lucky, <laughs> I didn't say we are, uh, you, you may wind up with one of these holes passing us, rather, and we don't get too much dust. Otherwise, you can get one of the stronger ones, and you really get clobbered with lots of dust material and, and heat. But you don't know. It's, it's a, it's a crapshoot. Okay, tactites uh, in Apollo 12 samples. What I'm trying to show you here is the chemical compositions and what they found on the moon are similar to what Luis Alvarez is trying to sell off as 
um, coming from a meteor or asteroid. Um, science, 1970. This is when the stuff started coming back. Abstract, the glassy portion of lunar sample, there's the number from Apollo 12, is chemically more like tactites from Java than like any terrestrial igneous rocks. It, it satisfies all of the chemical criteria for a tactite. Tactites are relatively recent and acid rocks, whereas the moon is chiefly ancient and basilic. Hence, tactites are probably ejected volcanically rather than by impact from the moon. The reason I'm saying is volcanic because a lot of these beads are obviously from a very hot temperature, well over 1800 degrees centigrade. Some numbers I've seen as high as 3000. So he's trying to hang his hat on a volcano, but no volcano has been found on the moon. They think those volcanic uh, seas or where lava came up and magically made those big flat areas, but I don't think so. Uh, if taxox are really propelled by volcanism, the K, uh, potassium argon clock, it's a, it's a way of dating rock. Uh, on tactites was, has not set by impact but by volcanism. Volcanism is more plausible than impact because it is found impossible in the, li the laboratory to reset the KR, potassium argon clock, without vulcanizing the rock. That means heating up to very high temperatures, basically melting it into a, a liquid. That's what this means. He's trying to find a heat source, so he's only thinking in terms of a volcano. Wrong. Try that thing 93 million miles away. It's a lot hotter. An irid iridium-rich iron micrometeorite with silicate inclusions from the moon. Here's the references and, and everybody who is part of it. This is from NASA. And what year was it? I guess I didn't put the year down. Um, we found a 0.1 um, milligram iron micrometeorite it's one of these guys, but a lot smaller. The metal is 93% iron, 6.5% nickel, 0.5% cobalt, 150 parts per million iridium. You got that? You want to know where the iridium came from? And less than two parts per million gold. Don't go there and start mining gold. You can go to the Klondike. It's, there's more gold there. The bulk metal composition is typically of meteoric metal particles in Apollo 16 palmetic samples. It is similar to the um, iron nickel metal in Apollo 16 soils. Average, again there's the average there. But again, the, the uh, iridium as well as the osmium is associated seems to with nickel, which is interesting. It's iridium concentration, however, there's 150 parts per million as determined by INAA on the isolated particle, 100 times higher than that of typical Apollo 16 material. <laughs> it's way beyond, it's off, it's off the chart compared to what's on the surface of the Earth. That's why Luis Alvarez found iridium on that thin layer between the KT boundary. Hologens, mercury, lithium, and osmium. Osmia is part of those platinum group metals, also extremely rare. And Apollo 11, I think his, his first name is George. I read a lot of his journal articles. They're very good. He's in the government, Argonne National Laboratory. Osmium varies from 0.4 to 300 parts per billion, what they found on the moon. And here's a soil sample of 383 parts per billion. Uh, this is what they think is volcanic rock. 220 plus or minus 66 parts per billion. This is probably stuff like this or this stuff thrown off by the sun. You can't assume what the sun throws off is just little glass beads and particles and blobs of glass. It's probably everything under the sun. And that's why the moon exhibits so many 
uh, craters as well as Mars. And you can assume that some of this nickel iron meteorites are thrown off by the sun. It just creates matter, all types. Is uh, IS osmium uh, chemically fractionated in the moon? That means extreme heat. In several determinations of osmium in four uh, iridations of samples, because they had to take, they take a sample and they bombard it with protons. And the reading they get out of it is how they know these, uh, these, these elements are there because they're such small quantities. Uh, Bracca means like soil. Uh, fires on the average of 22 parts per billion. And here's their count, up to 31 parts per billion, which is vastly higher than what's on the, on the Earth. Apollo 16 deep drill core Samples from the top 10 centimeters, that's only like four inches. Gave 26, 26, 62, that's really high, 44. That, these concentrations are rather high even for soil samples. Now the graph here, this is plotting iridium to osmium. It's almost like a 45 degree angle, which shows they, they appear both about the same rate. Uh, and iridium is like 20 parts per billion, and here is up to 50 parts per billion. So this sample was a little higher than the iridium. But they're, they're both extremely rare earth metals, and here's the references for them. <clears throat> Trace element relations between Apollo 14 and 15 and other lunar samples, and the implications of a moon-wide CI creep coherence and PT metal co uh, non-coherence. PT again, the platinum series. There's the reference. <clears throat> the samples of rock and soil and glass beads that had iridium ranged from 10 parts per billion to 107 parts per billion. That's amazingly high, 107. The average was 38.2 parts per billion. It depends on the sample that they grabbed. Um, that is much higher than, than found on the crust of the Earth at 0.26 parts per billion. The osmium concentration in Apollo 14 samples vary considerably. Uh, decreasing from soil to fragmental uh, to ig igneous rocks in the other. And this is their approach. From 67 to 11 parts per billion. The 67 is really high. The abundance reported for the other platinum metals, iridium, RE, and PD, appear to be correlated to one another and to meteoric solar system abundances. That was their words. In other words, they're trying to find a source for this stuff. And... They're hoping it's a meteor. Well, my iron nickel is probably what they're referring to. This may be the source of it. <clears throat> uh, have associated with extra lunar, well, let me continue. But uh, as a consequence, their abundance in the lunar surface have been associated with extra lunar meteoric sources. In other words, they know it didn't come, it wasn't from the moon, it came it was delivered to the moon. And the only place that's going to deliver this kind of volatiles, this kind of material, is the sun. There isn't any other source of it. Osmium and ru ru ruithium uh, deviate from these factors relative to each other, PT metals, and to each other. Osmium appears to have been fractionated. That means melted, <laughs> really melted. Um, to a liquid by processes, probably magmic occurring on the moon. Again, they can't figure out the heat source, except if they looked off the moon, which they were implying, and look at the sun. No problem for a heat source on the sun, right? They don't want you to look there. They want you to look everywhere plus but there. <clears throat> This is another paper. Uh, it was given at the um, 19, 2015 Geological Society of America's annual meeting. I didn't go to it, but I'm a member of the GSA. And these guys had a great time there. Now, they found an island, this little tiny thing here, in Gorg uh, Gorgana Island in, off the coast of Chile. There it is. There's Chile, and that's where it is little tiny speck of something, and this is the island off the coast. 
And this is their KPG or KT boundary right there. So, and this little thing is like 500 meters off the coast, as you can see. And this is what they found at that level. Now, this is blown up picture. There's our little glass beads. How do you like that? So here's Cretaceous, and all of a sudden you have this. Now, that island 65 million years ago, which is what they're trying to date this thing, was at least three to 400 feet below sea level. So, and it's on the other side of the Isthmus of Panama, which may not have been there at all. It may have been just open sea. So if a meteor hit in uh, the Yucatan, then I could see where there'd be a big tidal wave, but this thing is, this place is like 12, was it 1800 miles away? And here, and this is where they think the impact was. Now these line, these little circles here are other references of tactites and other material from a impact, but they don't know the dates obviously. Uh, but they're trying to make it look like it's this. And they can't do that. Intellectually, they can't do that. But anyway, that's where it is. I mean, 1,800 miles away, you're not going to have that much. And the only way that could accumulate like that, I give you, I present this. The Sun Novus is going to evaporate a lot of water, 700, 800 feet, which means that little island, it wasn't an island then, would have been above water and the dust shell would have come down and landed on it, and then it could accumulate like that. This is a close-up of it. Not the best. I should have done a better job, but this is all I, I had to work with. Um, so all the little round sphericals. They did a lousy job of the chemical composition of these things. You'll see later. This is a, um, a microscope um, of some of the yellow bees. This is the same color of the stuff they found on the moon. The reason that it looks so beautiful as the stuff on the moon is because this stuff is supposedly 65 million years old. So it's going to look all banged up and chemical um, erosion on the, on the edges of it and stuff like that. But this is from Mexico and this is from Haiti. So, uh, you know, what I'm trying to show is these little glass bees or tactites or microtactites, they call them, landed all over the world. It's not from an impact. It's from a star and the dust shell hitting us 17 or 18 hours later. It's the only way you can get this uniform all over the world in the same chemical composition. There's an electron microscope of that. Again, little tiny glass beads are a half to a third of a millimeter. And this, is, this mark is a half a millimeter. So you see from one millimeter down to tiny, uh, same size as the stuff found on the moon, no difference. Here's an electron microscope even greater, magnified 65 times. Little round beads, 65 million years old, a little banged up, a little cracked up, but same material found on the moon. <clears throat> this is from their article. About 70 to 90% of the spherical's microtactites and other type of tactites are vitrified, meaning a tremendous amount of heat hit it. Like what do you think the heat, the temperature of that dust shell is when it comes at us, right? Got to be at least, you know, 12, 1500 degrees centigrade, maybe even higher. I don't know. And nobody else knows either. The fluid, fluid shape forms smooth surfaces and inter, integral internal textures indicate, indica, indicative of an origin as molten droplets from a highly fluid melt with subsequent exsolution of a gas phase due to pressure release and cooling. Imagine this stuff is in a dust shell from a star that is nova, and this dust shell is coming at us. It's a shock wave at 1,550 miles per second. That's a shock wave. That would fit this bill, what he's saying here, exactly. Then it cools down when it enters our atmosphere and, and lands? Yes, probably. Uh, Gorgonelia spherical's uh, layer, uh, layer represents an almost unaltered primary suspension settling deposit. True. The question is, was the island above ground when this thing landed or it settled through some of the water? But 
the water level would have been down for quite a bit of time, maybe a couple of decades until enough snow melted to bring it up and cover the island again. But it's your call. It's almost anybody's guess because nobody was there then. <clears throat> anyway, this is the distance, 1,800 miles. These are the chemicals they found. I hope they do a better job of a real breakdown of the chemical composition, but there's aluminum, titanium, iron, magnesium, potassium, sodium, calcium. Here's the, here's the level they're examining here. These are all one and multiple celled animals. They become extinct here. And this is how they spotted some of them and where they found them reworked. But probably these are the new species. Probably some of these belong over here. Their DNA or genes were altered by the cosmic and gamma rays that made this guy maybe produce this one over here, you know? But nobody knows, but because we don't know the mechanism, we know the DNA is altered by cosmic gamma rays. So if they were hit, then they were modified, just like we were modified. And you wind up with a new species, so maybe they're incorrectly calling these a new species, but they probably came from one of these. And next, this is another example of a geologist or team trying to find a way to get fam uh, famous by saying they found another meteor impact that may explain another extinction. Impact eject at the Pliocene-Eocene boundary. That's 58 million years ago. There's the journal article, Science. Here we report the discovery of silicate glass spherules in a discrete stratigraphic layer from three marine PE boundary sections on the Atlantic, Mar uh, Mar it was off coast of New Jersey, Pennsylvania, and Delaware, and down here across from Florida, actually directly across from Jacksonville. How do you like that? <clears throat> Distinct characteristics identify the sphericals as microtactites and micro case I can't pronounce that word. Uh, indicating that an extraterrestrial impact occurred during the carbon isotope excursion at the PE boundary. There's our little glass beads. That's the marker. Here's what they found. This is what they look like. This is uh, 0.2 of a millimeter, 0.1 of a millimeter, and this is actually what they look like. Same thing that we got from the sun, uh, from the moon rather. Uh, it is worth noting that the IR anomaly has been identified at the PE boundary section at Zumaya, Spain, although it has been interpreted as volcanic in origin, and, which can't be, by the way. And in deposits from Slovi Slovenia, however, a large iridium anomaly is not necessarily associated with all major impacts, i.e. the Chesapeake impact. They think there was a meteor that hit the Chesapeake Bay area. Maybe it was aiming for Washington, D.C. No, it could be. That's the end of this. Um, the, the next video, I'm going I'm, I'm to cover the, the uh, crater that they found buried in, in an ice field in Greenland, which they're trying to pin on, as that was all about 12,000 years ago, and that was causing the mass extinction of large mammals in North America. Fat chance of that. Uh, mass extinction and creation of new species and Antarctic extinctions and magnetic reversals. Uh, the Dial Foundation is a 501c3 science foundation. Uh, the contributions, if I get enough of them, I want to hire some geology students to help me do some of the research because it, it's going to take a lot of proof to convince the majority of people and government, the politicians, to, to basically force NASA and the CIA to come clean how much they know. If I'm right, which I believe I am, and the actions of Luis um, Alvarez kind of prove I am, and others, uh, then we don't have much time. The next Gleisberg cycle is between September and December 2046, 
And it's real possible that this thing could happen then, which means not many of us are going to make it. And I'd like, a, the reason I'm doing these videos is that some people survived this thing, but so few people survived it last time. Like I mentioned earlier, I haven't found the reference yet, and I hope to, or maybe somebody out there will, that some anthropologists estimated only 30 fertile females survived the last ice age. That's, that's extinction level. Even if they're wrong by a factor of, a, of 10 or 100, that's extinction level. It's a, a damn big planet. Anyway, I hope you'll learn something from this, and you'll, you'll learn a lot more in the second video, which I'm going to hopefully get up by tomorrow.